Father, we have come to listen to your word today. We're asking, Lord, that you will change our hearts, make us more like you. Help us, Lord, to live the way that you would have us to live and to shine in our communities and to show others your love. I pray now that you will be with me as I present this sermon and help it to go well. We pray in your name. Amen. Can any of you remember the first time you laid eyes on your husband or wife? I see some smiles. <laughs> I bet you your heart was going thump, thump, thump. <laughs> I know a few weeks ago I was talking to Ron at Potluck, and he was describing to me the first time he had laid eyes on his wife, how beautiful she was. Not yet his wife, not yet his girlfriend, but somebody he was very interested in finding out more about. <laughs> and he arranged, he went out of his way to try and find a way that he could end up in the same place that she was. Anyway, it all worked out, and here they are today. And I'm sure if you were to ask Ron if Justina was just as beautiful as the day he met her, he would probably have the words, she's more beautiful than the day I met her. And I guess that would be the way for each one of us, probably. I'm saying probably because some don't go quite so well. But you know full well that Ron's eyesight must be failing because Justina is not as lovely as the day he met her. Even though she's doing very well, she's not <laughs> quite the girl she was the day he first laid eyes on her. Now, we can be thankful for failing eyesight sometimes, but I don't know really that it is failing eyesight. I think the longer we spend with somebody that we mesh with, the better off they become in our eyes. And we can overlook some of the things that maybe get in the way of relationships. We can overlook some of the hardness. We can overlook some of the things that other people would find fault with because we see all the lovely things. Wouldn't it be lovely if we could look at people that way and we could see just the lovely things that God sees? Because that's how God is. When he looks at our ugly faces, <laughs> in his, you know, I shouldn't say it that way, but in God's eyes, he created man beautiful. Now, we don't know what that was like, but we know that it's more beautiful than anything, any girl, any guy that we've seen on this earth because God created them perfect. When, when God looks down, he sees his lovely child. He sees a lovely character. He's not always happy maybe with the characters that we have developed, but he sees the beauty in us. And the longer we spend with somebody, communicating with them, seeing the lovely things they do for one another, I mean, I'm sure that I'm, I'm picking on Ron and Justina this morning, but I could pick on just about anybody. But I'm sure that if Ron didn't take the time to do the little things for Justina, it might not be anything big, but just the little things, sitting down and talking, maybe doing a crossword puzzle together, or just having, having a game of Scrabble with somebody. Well, maybe Ron doesn't do that, but <laughs> anyway, the little things are what build up to be the big things. Those are what make the beauty in people. Mary wasn't a lovely person. She had done many, many things that were wrong, and when she was dragged over in front of Jesus and thrown at his feet, did Jesus see the ugliness that other people saw? No, he saw Mary's beauty. And he forgave her for the things that she had done wrong. Even though he was a perfect man, he had lived a perfect life, he still saw some perfection in Mary. And he still loved her. His heart went out because he knew that she was a broken person, and he continued to care. How many times did that happen? It wasn't just the one time, was it? It was over and over again. But Jesus continued to see the beauty where other people couldn't. And other people would look at Mary and say, we shouldn't associate with her. Walk to the other side of the road. 
But the very people that had brought Mary into this sin were the very ones that dragged her out and tried to condemn her. And Jesus knew that her heart, there was goodness, there was something precious that he wanted to develop there, and he wanted to see that grow. And so when Jesus was eating his last, one of the last meals that he, it wasn't the last one, but one of the last ones and meeting with friends, who was the person that came and brought that alabaster bottle to anoint him? And she cried and she wiped her tears and her uh, ointment into his feet with her hair, dried it off with her hair. She was, her heart was fully broken to know that Jesus had done so much for her. It wasn't that she knew he was going to die because at that point she didn't know he was going to die. Maybe she did have some insight to it because he did talk about it. But in this case, I believe that her heart was broken because she had been such a sinner, but she knew that she had been accepted and loved by Jesus and forgiven. What about the Samaritan woman? When she came to the well, she came during the middle of the day, kind of snuck in there. Now you'd think around here in Newfoundland, if we went to the well during the middle of the day, or Tim Hortons, we could say, we're going there to meet up with people. But back there, it was hot, hot, hot in the middle of the day. So people never drew well from the water from the well during the middle of the day. They always came in the cool of the day, either early morning or the evening to draw their well water. But this Samaritan woman came in the middle of the day because she was so ashamed of the life that she was living. People would talk about her, they ran her down, they didn't have much good to say about her, and I don't think she felt very good herself about who she was and what she was doing. But somehow life had taken over, and she had gotten involved with one thing after another, one sin after another, um, and she became the person that everybody kind of looked down on, except for Jesus. He was sitting on a bench and he talked to her and he wanted to know about her life and he wanted to share the fact that she had a future and she had love like from him and she had forgiveness from him. She did not know who he was. She had heard about the Messiah but she didn't really know who Jesus was. And Jesus said, go and call your husband. She says, I know, I don't, I don't have a husband. And Jesus turned and said, but you have many. Like, you know, he knew exactly what she had been going through. And he, he knew her. He had experienced what she was experiencing. He had accepted her. And he wanted her to know that he knew that. So he said, go and call, and that she brought back anyone that would listen to, listen to this man that could tell her everything about her life, that knew her inside and out, but yet accepted who she was and loved her the way she was. So she wanted to tell everybody about him, and she brought back a huge crowd, and they sat and listened to Jesus, these Samaritan people were people that weren't fit to come to a church like we have here today. If they were to walk into our church today, back if we compared it to back then, I think people would slide to the other side. They wouldn't want to listen. They, would, they wouldn't want these people in their church. But Jesus felt that this person was worth saving, so he shared with her, and he loved her despite what she looked was. I listened, um, at, I read some of these stories and I was thinking, what makes us love others? What is it that made Ron look at Justina and say, I have to get to know her better? What makes it that when let's say Joel and Rachel left and went away, it left an empty spot in our hearts because they were gone. And now when they come back, it puts a smile on our face again. What is it that makes us look around and form friendships? What is it that, that causes that love and that acceptance to grow? 
I think it's when we get an opportunity to know somebody, when we get an opportunity to communicate with somebody and talk to them, we really get to know who they are, right? And it's no different with God. We have him, he's up in heaven, or Jesus, he returned to heaven to build a home for us because he said he's coming back to get us. Now, if we had a friend that went away somewhere and they said they were coming back, now they couldn't give us a time or a date that they were coming. We knew that Joel and Rachel were coming back and we were excited and happy. Those of us that knew about that, we were happy. We couldn't wait for them to return. But you know what? I didn't expect them to walk in here today because I didn't know when the date was that they were coming. Now, that's a, a kind of an illustration, but not really. But, you know, it's like that with Jesus. We know he's coming back, but we don't know when. But let's look around at the stuff that's happening today in the world. The fires that are burning, the wars that are raging, the, I mean... There's a lot of things politically that are happening. There's a lot of things within our schools. There's a lot of things within our communities that are happening that tell us that the devil is not out of this world. He's still here and he's creating havoc and it's causing us a lot of trouble and it's causing us a lot of anxiety. And you know, just this week, um, Eden and Isaac decided they were going to go out and start selling some cookies to raise some money because Willow has gone back in for her treatments. And they decided they were going to start selling some cookies to raise some money for gas for them to go do the treatments for Willow because they got to go every day. And so they went out and they sold cookies. What caused them to want to do that? The love of Jesus in their heart is what caused them. What caused what Willow is going through is the devil and sin that has entered this world. But do you see what happens? The devil and sin came into the world, and we don't have to accept it. We can fight back. And we can show them that Jesus is just as alive in this world as the devil. So even though somebody is going through a hard time here, there's somebody over here that's a Christian that knows the love of God. And they can show that to this other person, no matter how big or how small they are. I was listening to uh, the radio, just turned it on, and a song came up, which was kind of like, it caught my attention. It wasn't a song that you'd want to listen to because it wasn't, it wasn't, uh, an, to me, it wasn't a nice sounding song, but the words caught my attention. And so I'll tell you that now. Um, it says, um, I only talk to God when I need a favor. Is that true sometimes? Huh? When, we, when we need a favor, we only talk to God when I need a favor? I only talk to God when I don't have a prayer. I only pray when I don't have a prayer. Sorry, I don't see that very well. So I only talk to God when I need a favor. I only pray when I don't have a prayer. So in other words, when it looks so desperate, that it's, it's not, like the prayer's not going to do anything, this person is saying they pray at that time. But it's so desperate that he doesn't have a prayer, but he's praying anyway. And then it goes on, who am I to expect a Savior if I only talk to God when I need a favor? Now that's a, that, this wasn't a Christian song. This was a song on, another, uh, on, on the radio. And I'm thinking to myself, this person had it figured out. You know, like, how can we expect to have a relationship with God or that we only talk to him when we need something? Each one of us, think about this. In the relationships that you're forming out in the society or in this church or with your family or whatever, if you only sat down and talked to them when you were needed the lawn mode, or when you needed uh, something uh, cooked for supper, <laughs> or when you needed the floor scrubbed, or wood brought in, or whatever it might be, and you never talked to them about anything else, you never shared anything else, you never did anything else, where would that relationship end up? Not very good, right? And so I, I was 
thinking about today and this sermon, and I was thinking to myself, as a church, what do we do? As a church, are we showing the people that we're praying for that we love them, that God loves them? Because really, God is allowing us not needing us. He's allowing us to show his character and his love to other people so that they understand who he is. And that's what a Christian is. It's somebody that is Christ-like. Now, am I always Christ-like in my life? No, I fall far short. And most of us do. We don't always carry that sermon in shoes, as we say, that we should be. But we have that opportunity, and it's a blessed opportunity that we have to share what God has done in our lives and what he wants to do in other people's lives. And so when we pray, is it personal? Do we know, like, okay, so you're praying for somebody. God, can you heal this person? I'll go back to the story with Eden and, and, and Isaac. Um, and there's many more people that are doing the same thing. I'm just using them as an example because they're, they're close. And I, <laughs> but we could pray for Willow. We can pray all day long. Or we can pray for Nevaeh or whoever it might be. And we know God can heal them. But see, we still live in a world of sin. And so we have somebody say, well, if God loved me, why would he allow this to happen? He's allowing it because of the choice that was made a long time ago to allow sin to enter this world, okay? So the sin is allowed to come here, is allowed to reign. Satan became the, the person that the, the world, he was allowed into this world to tempt, to cause this sin and all that. And so we'll have all this sickness and sadness and sin and, and awful things going on around us until the day God returns, but Jesus, his love is the fact that he has allowed us to show who he is by the things that we do. And even though you might have word that somebody has, is dying or somebody has died, they're going to be taken away from you at a young age. And I know I can stand up and say this because maybe it doesn't affect me right now. Maybe my children are all safe. They haven't had any bad diagnosis or anything like this. But I would hope, as a Christian, I could always stand and say this, no matter what happens. That when that child or that adult, whoever it might be, is taken away from this world, if I have done my part as a Christian, and I have shared the love of Jesus, and they have that love in their hearts, then they're not leaving for good. They're coming back. And that when Jesus returns, he will give them that home that he has promised. And he will reward them. And, you know, and so is it right for me to keep that a secret? Is it right for me to allow people to go on suffering and not have a part to play in, in helping that? It's not. And so it comes down to I don't need to only talk to God when I need a favor. I need to talk to him on a daily basis so that he can come into my life and he can change me so I can be more like him. Because as I stand here in front of you, without him, I'm nothing. And without him, um, it would be like looking at somebody that, okay, here's a, another example. So we were outside one evening. Uh, Ramsey and Leah and myself and Bruce and we were walking around and we were talking and I don't know how it exactly came up but Ramsey looked at Bruce and he nudged him and he says my son he said look what we ended up with he says they're not like they used to be are they <laughs> so I mean his eyesight was great right <laughs> anyway it, it could be like that like are we growing more beautiful in God's eyes? Or are we starting to t deteriorate and become more of a thing that he wants to turn his back on and not, you know? 
So if I'm going through these wildfires that are blazing around the world, if I'm going through the war, if I'm going through famine and hunger, do I need to be afraid? First thing is that you have fear because you're human. But if you know that God is somebody that you talk to, not when you need a favor, but you talk to him on a regular basis, if you know who he is, he knows who you are. And you know that, and you have that connection. So it's just like sitting with your partner who's growing old and not as good as it used to be, but it's better than it ever was, right? And that's the way the connection between you and God should be. And that's the way the community around us, the people that are in distress, should know this because you're a Christian, growing closer to God, communing with him on a regular basis, you become his hands and his feet. And he doesn't need you, he's allowing you for your purpose and for the purpose of people in your community. So I hope that as we leave here today, that we will keep this in mind and we will begin to talk to God, not just when we need a favor, but we will be able to talk to him all the time so that when we look at God and we look at the people around us, they become more beautiful not less beautiful with age and time and wear and tear, but they become more beautiful in our eyes and that we can be to them what he wants to be for us. Our Father, I want to thank you for the opportunity to have a story to tell of your resurrection, your love, and your goodness and how you're coming again to take me home with you. Father, help me to be ready. Help me to see the beauty in you and those around and help me to tell your story. We pray in your name. Amen.